All right, welcome back, guys. We're going to pick up with Chapter 5 here of 1984 in my book. We are on page 48. So uh, we have an introduction of a, a really interesting new character here, Syme. Uh, at least that's how I think you pronounce it. Syme is, appears to be Winston's friend, um, maybe one of his only friends, but realistically, Winston notes that there are no friends in this society. So Syme is as close as you can get to a friend, but really there aren't friends, there aren't close relationships any longer. Um, they're just comrades. That's sort of the equalization of society that's occurring where everybody's on the same level with each other. Um, everybody is a comrade to everybody else. So um, just going through chronologically here with some minor points, um, we have a indication that there's a shortage of razor blades. And we've talked about these production shortages before. The shortage of razor blades, Winston notes, again, reminding the reader that if there is a shortage of a, of a material, you're forced to go to what's called a free market, which is basically a place where you can acquire goods that the government isn't able to produce. Syme loves the hangings. And if you recall, Miss Parsons' children are very upset that they can't attend the hangings. Syme loves these hangings, and it's just another way to indicate how orthodox he is. And so orthodox basically in this context means that you're following the rules that are laid out very closely. You don't question the rules. You certainly don't disobey the rules. If anything, you thrive within the structure. So Syme loving these hangings is a, is a way for him to indicate how very orthodox he is. Syme's job is to work on the new speak dictionaries. So he is kind of an authority of the language. But really, he is not creating words, but destroying them cutting down the language to the bone. And so this is one of the most important aspects of this chapter, the destruction of words. So I'm going to read you a quote from Syme on page 51 um, that begins with, it's a beautiful thing. And then we'll do a little analysis of it. Syme says, it's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Of course, the great wastage is in the verbs and adjectives. But there are hundreds of nouns that can be got rid of as well. It isn't only the synonyms, there are also the antonyms. After all, what justification is there for a word which is simply the opposite of some other words? A word contains its opposite in itself. Take good, for instance. If you have a word like good, what need is there for a word like bad? Ungood will do just as well. Better, because it's an exact opposite, which the other is not. Or again, if you want a stronger version of good, what sense is there in having a whole string of vague, useless words like excellent and splendid and all the rest of them? Plus good covers the meaning, or double plus good if you want something stronger still. Of course, we use those forms already, but the final version of Newspeak, there will be nothing else. In the end, the whole notion of goodness and badness will be covered by only six words. In reality, only one word. Don't you see the beauty of that, Winston? It was BB's idea originally, of course, he added as an afterthought. And so here, the destruction of words is, is, a, is a very important concept to 1984 and Orwell's contribution to our language. I really want to know what all of you have to say about this, and this is going to be one of the topics of our, of our seminar discussions, so I'm not going to spell too much out for you here. Um, we'll post those recordings of the discussion so that people can uh, hear what we all have to say collectively, and I'll, I'll post the link once that's taken uh, place. But for now, just some general thoughts that I have would be about what do we think about taking away what I would consider to be precision from our language. For example, you know, excellent and splendid rather than plus good. Um, these words not only add precision, nuance to our language, but also possibly things like beauty, aesthetic value. That's one idea that I have is what is the value of taking away um, precision from the language? And by extension, if we're thinking about language as you know an extension of our thought, is there any way that limiting the language itself is limiting our thoughts? And 
Syme himself says that the entire goal of Newspeak, the inevitable goal, would be to actually narrow the range of thought. And so what our discussion is going to be about is what do we think about the relationship between language and thought? Is there a relationship? What is the correlation? And how much do we think that a limited language could potentially limit our thought? One of my favorite phrases is the idea that the whole notion of goodness and badness will be covered by only six words. And something that we try to talk about in this class is that, you know, the idea of good and bad and, and being a good person versus a bad person is a very, you know, a, a nuanced line. And, there, and there's a lot of gray area rather than the black and white of being good and bad, you know. Um, being a good person or a bad person, I think, is a, a simplified way to look at people. So if there's a simplify a simplification of the language in terms of good and bad, is that going to inhibit people from seeing nuance in people and seeing people as you know good or bad people? So let's leave that there. And, and so we have some more open-ended um, questions to answer in our talk. There's another great passage from Syme on page 52. And I'm just going to read a couple sentences from it and leave it open so that we can discuss them together. In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. And then just a little bit further down, every year, fewer and fewer words and the range of consciousness always a little smaller. So let me know what you guys think about those passages in our discussion. All right, so continuing on, um, Sime makes some comments about the proles and the, the role of the proles in our society, their language. This is a little bit of foreshadowing because, you know, we can try and extrapolate or think about what's going to happen in the future. If the proles are outside of the society and potentially they're going to be the keepers of old speak, what predictions can we make about the role of the proles in the future where everybody else in society is going to be beholden to new speak? Now, it's ironic that, you know, the proles are seen as uneducated and backwards because of their um, use of old speak. But again, if this is foreshadowing, I don't want to spell it out for you. And I want you to be able to make some predictions on your own. The most important aspect of this chapter is the idea of Syme's thoughts on the destruction of words and ideological speech. And so, you know, his, his idea that the party slogans will inevitably change, for example, like freedom is slavery, because freedom as a word won't exist. And as a concept, it won't exist. Literature will be dead. I find that very interesting. If the word freedom does not exist, will you be able to have the concept of freedom in your mind? Will you be able to strive for freedom as a society if that concept is dead in the culture and the language? That's a question for you all to answer. One last quote from, from Syme here uh, in this section on the destruction of language on page 53. Syme says, the whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. And again, you know, this goes back to our first lesson on Socrates and the, the value of questioning because to question necessitates a kind of consciousness or a, re a resistance to orthodoxy. And I think that's what Orwell's pointing out here is that orthodoxy is unconsciousness, meaning to simply absorb an ideological framework and to regurgitate it takes no thought. And this is, you know, kind of parallel, unfortunately, to our models of education, our popular models of education. Some people might call this the banking method. Um, there's a lot of constructionists who, who disavow this idea that you students, you know, you're just empty brains that we're going to fill up with facts and information. And that's the goal of education. And while I think there's an argument to be had there, I do think that there's more value in giving you the processes to to formulate your own ideas rather than just giving you a bunch of rote facts to memorize. And so you can think of an ideology as that kind of banking method where people are putting facts, quotes, slogans, you know, party lines, little phrases for you to remember and then spit back out 
rather than having the tools to think, question, formulate your own phrases, ideas, and and communicate in an actual dialogue with somebody else who, who might not think the same thing. So along with the destruction of the language, we're going to have another um, seminar on ideological speech and how we, we see that occurring in our modern society. So anywhere um, that you you find these connections, make sure to jot that down in your notes. And Orwell finally has this idea that ideological speech is very predictable and it can seem thoughtless, right? There's nothing surprising that's going to come out of ideological speech. It's speech from the throat, not speech from the brain. It's kind of a muscle memory of the throat. And so if you're hearing somebody talk and everything that they say is familiar, right? They're all phrases that you've heard on on news or in media, short sound bites, things like that. There's nothing interesting or surprising about that speech. And you can usually predict a whole host of ideas that and values that that person has based on those little ideological quips. And so the idea is that interesting speech requires complexity and a rejection of ideology to say something new, to say something different and refreshing that comes from actual critical analysis from a unique place in your own mind. So definitely focus on the role of um, the destruction of language and ideological speech in this chapter. Let's move on to a couple other um, plot-based events. Parsons' daughter, um, so Parsons, we know Mrs. Parsons, we've already met her. Now we're meeting Mr. Parsons. And Mr. Parsons kind of has the same orthodoxy, but at a different level than Syme, whereas Syme is very intelligent, Mr. Parsons seems not so much. Um, Parsons is very excited that his daughter ratted out a suspicious man while she was training in the spies and probably gets him killed just because he has strange shoes on. And they're calling that keenness. And the idea is that keenness is just the, um, the excitement to be able to follow and participate in the orthodoxy. The fact that you're really you know, enthralled, excited to be a part of the party and to work for Big Brother. And you're ready to go out there and do the best job you can um, you know, to spy as a, as a young girl. As they're having this discussion in the cafe, there's a little telescreen announcing from the mini plenty that the standard of living rose 20% this year. And again, like many of the announcements from the mini plenty, they just don't seem to map onto the real world, right? Um, they're eating pink slop and you know a little sugar tablet and some bread. But the standard of living rose 20% and you know anybody can look around and ask for who, but nobody really is doing that because to ask would be to die, essentially. Um, my own reader response to this, you know, this reminds me of in our current uh, situation, the stock market, um, how the stock market is being, you know, used more and more so as an indicator of the health of our economic status for the United States, where, you know, in reality, for most people, the stock market doesn't really represent their wealth or their standard of living at all. And we can see this in our response to COVID-19 as well, as, as many people are struggling and the stock market is hitting you know, new highs. How does that really make sense? How does that really reflect the standard of living for most people? Um, again, these are my own responses or connections to the reading. It's not something that maybe you're going to have, but I'm just demonstrating how I want you to make connections to the outside world as you're reading and reflect on if there are similarities. So the mini plenty continues to announce, hey, we have more of everything. We've got more shoes. We've got more chocolate, more of everything except, of course, disease, crime, and insanity. And, you know, this is for the purpose, uh, this is to demonstrate that crime cannot exist in a socialist utopia. Um, this is something that, you know, Dostoevsky uh, challenges and, and tries to, to write about and to justify in some of his work. Well, the idea is that if you're living in a utopian society, everything is perfect, right? So there can't be crime because um, many, especially socialist utopias, have this idea of 
of the of a social constructionist where that crime is the fault of the society not the individual right a crime is not a choice that the individual makes but rather it's the constraint of the society forcing that person to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do so if you have a perfect society there would be no crime and of course um the mini plenty is reporting that you know crime has been abolished there is no more disease everything is just dandy but again, on page 59, Winston's reality doesn't seem to match the fantastic news on the telescreen, and these figures aren't translating to real people's lives. One thing that I think is curious that we can try and discuss, um, which you know seems like a generalization, but it's, it's an artful one. It's curious how the beetle-like type proliferated in the ministries. And so Winston's noting there's a particular look a particular aesthetic, a way that the people look who make it into high positions of power within the, the society. You know, they're short, they're fat, they look beetle-like, they've got like bug eyes. And I'm curious what you guys think about that and if there's any sort of like symbolism that um, Orwell is uh, imparting on us. So going back to Winston's observation that Syme is very intelligent and Parsons is not, Winston notes that Parsons and the duck man, the man who's talking across the table and it sounds like quack, 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 quack. Winston notes that Parsons and the duck man would not be vaporized, but he and Syme would be. And this goes back to, and you know, probably misses Parsons as well. This goes back to the idea that Syme has too much intelligence for his own good. He's too logical for his own good. So is Winston. You know, this kind of intelligence or logic is going to inevitably be stamped out of society because it's a method to maintain control. You can't have people in the society who actually have critical thinking skills if you want to manipulate them and control them. It's a danger. It's a threat to the people in power. And so that's, again, a key concept of our classes. And education is a way to empower yourself to be able to resist, you know, the people that would rather just manipulate you and keep you in the dark. Um, thought and rationality are ways to resist these kinds of systems. Now we have one more important plot element here. He sees the girl with the dark hair from the fiction department looking at him. And this is the second time he's seen her and she's been sitting close to him. So repetition legitimizes, just like in music. And the repetition here of seeing the girl is a device that we would call foreshadowing. And I already mentioned that in the past. If you're not familiar, foreshadowing is basically the author is giving you a clue of something to come. Now, you might not know what that clue is, but because of the repetition legitimizing, that means, hey, we need to pay attention. So now that this is the second time that Winston is very clearly pointing out this girl, Orwell is by extension telling us, the readers, pay attention and make some predictions. So I want to hear what you guys have to think about what will happen with this girl in the fiction department. Is she monitoring it, monitoring him to report him as a thought criminal? Is she potentially an ally and trying to get closer to him in that way? I want to know what you all think. And by making these predictions, um, we're engaging in a more complete way with the text. Last but not least, I think this is kind of a funny um, little quip here. Winston notes that to have an unfavorable facial expression when good news from the party is announced is called face crime. And I just love that phrase, face crime. Um, the, here, the level of satire reaches absurdity. And so again, satires were poking fun at this idea of uh, new speak and double think. But it's, now it's to the point where it's just ridiculous, right? That your face can be a crime. Like if the mini plenty announces, hey, we've got so much more boots. If you have this face, when they announce that there's more boots, that could be an expression of you being a thought criminal. I know I said last but not least, sorry, I'm a liar. Two more quick points that I found interesting. Um, Parsons is thrilled that the, the spies are being given ear trumpets for listening through keyholes. This is just a little amplifier that kids can poke through the hole in the door to assist in their spying. And that just shows his orthodoxy, how thrilled he is that kids are going to be able to further spy on their own parents. And then lastly, a little bit of symbolism or maybe a metaphor as Winston gets up to leave. 
even after carefully trying not to lose the tobacco in his cigarette, he gets up and all the tobacco falls out. And if you have any ideas about what that might symbolize or what might imply for the future, let me know. All right, guys, great job. I'll see you in chapter six.